one, you know. And I'd say, you know, the first one to the bus gets on, you know. And it was this sort of this crazy American attitude that I had, you know. Uh, and I think it was very American that we are a, a people who who are very smart, you know, that we've got a lot of street smarts. I mean, we know what the law is all about. We know who made it and how it gets enforced. I mean, I think if you stop the average American and say, what's the law all about? Did God make it? You say, oh, bullshit, God didn't have anything to do with it. You know who made it. John D. Rockefeller made it. How can you tell an American? Has he any distinguishing flavor? Would you spot him on an elephant in Turkestan? Floating on a raft 50 miles at sea As you'd know a single leaf from the sassafras tree By its characteristic savor It isn't that he's short or tall It isn't that he's round or flat It isn't that he's civilized or aboriginal Nor the head size of his hat that he hates and eternally despises the policeman on his beat and the judge at his assizes the sheriff with his warrants and the bureaucratic room for the sole and simple reason that they tell him what to do and he insists on eating he insists on drinking he insists on reading he insists on thinking free of governmental snooping or a governmental plan and that Rodeo you've been to? No, this is the second time. We just moved to Truckee last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you enjoy it? Uh, it's a great event every year. <laughs> so you plan to come back next year? Obviously, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, something, there's something about the rodeo that you think is uniquely American. Is there something that it says about the American character? Uh, independence and uh, individual ruggedness. <laughs> That's probably the, uh, the cowboy, the idea of the cowboy mm -hmm. still. Yeah. Let me just get over on the boulevard here a little bit. Just kind of rest there a little bit. We haven't had any chargeable accidents in all my life, and I don't want to run into some neighborhood kid here coming out of school right now or something. I think we're riding in a 1976 uh, Kenworth. It's one of them bicentennial trucks. They came out with uh, this bicentennial truck. Uh, for our 200th birthday, they made 200 of them. That's the reason for the, the red, white, and blue decoration on it. Basically, the running gear, the transmission, the engine, the rear ends are all all standard type uh, truck equipment. There's nothing uh, extra super special about it. Just the 350, if you're familiar with truck engines, the 350 comes. Yeah, I guess you'd say I'm independent. I don't owe no allegiance to anybody, and uh, what are the way I can... Uh, regulate my operation is either make or lose the money in the in the whole operation. So in that sense you're independent, but are well, there other ways in which you're not independent? Well, we're really not independent because you talk about independent truck drivers and then you get into the into the the political bureaucracy that we run out of the United States government there in, in Washington DC and mainly in the rules and regulations. Uh, I mean I don't think a man in Washington DC can dictate to me how to operate this truck but they do, don't financially they? right now that's what i'm saying that's why i say we've got educated smart in washington dc telling us guys and, it, and it's hard for me to to explain to somebody or make anybody understand that if you leave me alone i'll make a darn good living for myself and put a good piece of equipment on the road given the opportunity i'm not out here just uh, using this as a as a an excuse to get from point a to point b or from party to party i'm out here to uh, to make a good living, uh, raising four children with it, uh, got a wife, got a decent house there in Colorado Springs, and uh, if the government would leave me alone and back off in some of the rules and regulations, I could do even better. That's that's what I'm saying. There's a, uh, you know, just because you get let, uh, elected to an office or, or you become a, a political politician, whichever way you want to coin that phrase, don't necessarily make you uh, the big brother that's got to oversee everything that's under your domain and that's what's happening in Washington DC the people out there feel that uh, They got to be the big brother act that we're not smart enough down here to do our own thing 
one of the things that we're, that we're asking people and trying to explore in the film is not just the explicit anarchism of mm -hmm. um, the individuals of Warren and Tucker and Spooner, but but to, to, to find out whether there's um, kind of um, an implicit anarchist anarchism in in, in American traditions and American mm -hmm. political history. What's your feeling about that? Well, I think there's an implicit anarchism in any of the American uh, tendencies that have organized people uh, in opposition to the state. And I, I think co-ops uh, might have uh, reflected uh, this notion, organizing people not only in opposition to the, to the state, in effect, but uh, in opposition to the major uh, economic uh, uh, movement of the time. Uh, I think, as a matter of fact, just in the um, the romantic view of the American character, there's a, an anarchist tendency. It is flawed by one thing, the abstraction of patriotism. People who will damn the government from morning till night and oppose the state in, in a million and one ways will, at a time of, of, of national crisis, become incredibly patriotic and begin to say... They will do anything for the state, and they begin to talk of duty, service, sacrifice, all of the words that are the, the worst words in the world, it seems to me, in, in a human sense. Uh, they, they begin talking about Now, I don't know why this is, unless it is that these are such good-hearted people that they really believe that the American state is totally different from any other state, and it's certainly somewhat different and that they feel that it is important to preserve. They feel they're preserving the country, but the only language that is available is to preserve the state. I have an idea that one of these days there will be another language in which we can talk about preserving the country, the landscape, the neighborhoods, the people and the communities, without talking about preserving the state. At which point there'll be a lot of radical farmers factory workers and, and small town residents in this country. Climbing Milestone Mountain, August 22nd, 1937. For a month now, wandering over the Sierras, a poem had been gathering in my mind. Details of significance and rhythm the way poems do, but still lacking a focus. Last night I remembered the date and it all began to grow together and take on purpose. We sat up late while Denham moved over the zenith and I told Marie all about Boston, how it looked that last terrible week, how hundreds stood weeping impotent in the streets that last midnight. I told her how those hours changed the lives of thousands, how America was forever a different place afterward for, for many. In the morning we swam in the cold, transparent lake, the blue damselflies on all the reeds like millions of narrow metallic flowers, and I thought of you behind the grill in Dedham Vanzetti, saying, who would ever have thought we would make this history? Someday mountains will be named after you in Sacco. They will be here in your name with them when these names when these days are but a deem remembering of a time when man was wolf to man. I think men will be remembering you a long time, sitting on mountains, many men, a long time. Comrade. Oh, oh, psycho, psycho, oh, Nicola, psycho, oh, oh, psycho, psycho. I just want to sing your name. Psycho, 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 psycho. Oh, oh psycho, Nicola. Psycho, psycho. I just want to sing your name. Oh. Beginning with the First World War, an alliance of the Departments of Justice, Labor, and Immigration initiated a campaign of repression. Agents broke into the homes of suspected radicals, arrested them, and seized their possessions. Many were deported. Most of the victims were foreigners, usually Russians, Italians, and Jews. Two men stand out as targets of the anti-radical campaign. They were Italian-born, residents of Boston for many years, respectable workers, and dedicated anarchists.